So thank you very much for having me. Um, so before I talk about the, the neural basis of the dynamic unconscious, I think it's important to first define what we mean by consciousness and how do we separate the two. Um, in terms of definitions of consciousness, it's actually quite vague. Um, one is this sort of common sense definition. It's what goes away when you fall into a deep uh, sleep, a deep dreamless sleep. This was John Searle's definition. Um, another is just simply this phenomenological definition. It's just consciousness is what it feels like to be you, this first person subjective experience. Now, I went to this, this conference up in Aspen and for the whole week, and they gathered all these experts on consciousness, and the whole task for the week was to come up with a working definition of consciousness. And this was basically the best we could do after a week of debate, first person subjective experience. And again, it's very internal. I, I don't know that you're conscious. I assume you are because you behave as if you are, and I know that I am, but I can never sort of get inside your head and know what it feels like to be you. Some try to make a behavioral or an operational definition of consciousness. This would simply be complex, non-stereotyped um, behaviors that require working uh, short-term memory. Then there's simply a neurological definition where people say consciousness is the neurological correlates of consciousness, which kind of skirts around the issue of the definition. And now, more recently, which I'll talk about at the end, some people are coming up with theoretical definitions of consciousness. For example, it's a system's ability to integrate information. The, the definition that I sort of like to use as a working definition is that it's simply first-person subjective experience. It's what, what appears in the morning when you first wake up out of a deep, dreamless sleep, or what goes away at night when you either go into a, um, a dreamless sleep or some people in a coma. Um, but it's sort of this, this, these raw feels, what it feels like to be you, the, and also the sensation of seeing red. It doesn't have to be something complex like self-awareness. It could be simply um, smelling a rose and the sensation of the smell that you have as first-person experience. So as a neuroscientist, I like to take a, and, and most neuroscientists take a very pragmatic, empirical approach to the study of consciousness. It's no longer just left to the realm of philosophy. We can now use the tools of science and empirical investigation to try to understand this phenomena. <clears throat> what we take is a sort of general idea within neuroscience is that consciousness is an emergent property of certain biological systems. So emergent in that it arises from specific interactions among neurons and their elements. It's fully compatible with the laws of physics. We don't need to create any new um, mysterious new laws. Um, it might be very difficult to predict from the laws of physics, but we fundamentally believe that it arises specifically out of these interactions between neurons and their elements. Also, consciousness is not unique to humans. So if you take, let's say, a, a monkey or a, a great ape's brain and you look simply at the hardware and compare it to, let's say, a square millimeter of hardware of human cortex, it's, it's very difficult to tell the difference. So the, the hardware is the same. Um, behaviorally, it's the same. If you, if you have a dog or a cat and you step on their foot, it's going to yelp and sort of move its paw and, and run away in pain. It looks as if it's experiencing pain. It's having some level of consciousness, maybe not the same that we have, but at least we can assume that it might be feeling something. And finally, we have similar evolutionary history. So given these, these three facts, we assume that, con that other animals have some sense of consciousness, although it might be different than what it is that we experience. But the idea that they feel pain or experience uh, smells and colors. And finally, we think that there is this explicit correspondence between any mental event and its neural correlates. So fundamentally, all of these subjective phenomena and experiences we're having can be tied to the physical brain. How so? That still remains a mystery, but we're starting to investigate that now. But now to the unconscious. So here, this is just a simple, very simple example um, of, of a dissociation between a conscious awareness and behavior. Here in this task, the subject simply just had to grab a light whenever it lit up, whatever light lit up. But on some trials, let's say number two would, would light up, but then midway through it would switch to number one. And the, the, the subject could effortless, effortlessly do this and switch and choose target number one. But they actually were grasping the target about 300 milliseconds before they, they were verbally consciously aware that they had made the choice to move. So it's just a simple experimental example of showing there's many of our behaviors that we do 
outside of awareness and we only become conscious after the fact. If you think about you know, slamming on your brakes in your car or, or a tennis player or a golf player, um, first when they learn how to play it's conscious, then it becomes implicit and automatic and if they actually stop to think about it, it will, it will mess them up. So in some cases consciousness um, it works against you and we can do many complex behaviors without consciousness. And if you think about sleepwalking as well, people can do very complex things without awareness. So it, it leads to the question, well what is consciousness for anyway? What does it do? Um, does it have an evolutionary purpose? Maybe it doesn't. But if it did, if it does, what did it evolve for? And there's a number of different theories in this area. I mean, there's no clear answer. Some say that it evolved um, as a consequence of social uh, interaction, so that we can have a theory of mind to predict what somebody else might be doing next, and that would have an, an adaptive advantage. But up to this point, we really we don't know exactly what it's for. Some say that it's to make um, complex choices. So it's easy to do a reflexive action when there's only a certain number of um, possible behaviors. But as the behaviors become more and more complex, we need consciousness um, to do a very specific controlled action. For instance, if you wanted to grab one specific color jelly bean out of a jar, um, somehow you need to have working online working memory to keep it um, and, and choose exactly the specific jelly bean you want and somehow consciousness, you need consciousness for, for that particular action. But again, it's unknown. And given the fact about what I'm going to talk about, there's many, many complex things that occur in the unconscious that affect our behavior and our, and our, and our conscious thought. It, it leads to the question, you know, what is this consciousness for anyway? So, in terms of the unconscious, how do we measure it? Well, we can look at tasks like this in the lab, where basically you're presented with something, it hits your retina, this information is getting to your retina, it's getting to your visual cortex, your brain is processing it. Um, and there's a hidden message there, and you might not be aware of what that message is. However, if I now give you a task right after this, your behavior is going to be skewed based on the subliminal message. And we can do this both with when there's um, basically an element hidden in the picture, or we can flash things very quickly on a screen where people say they don't see anything, yet the information does get into the brain, processes it, and it affects behavior, all occurring outside of awareness. So can you see the hidden message here? So. For instance, I would show you this and then afterwards you'd be primed, but in this negative space here you see it says S-E-X. For this is psychoanalytic meaning. And <laughs> so um, you see, and then there's like the, the birds and the bees, and then the flowers are kind of like gesturing to each other. So, so there's a lot of different subliminal cues here. Now if I was to give you a task, maybe even a free association task following this, you'd be primed for sexual stimuli without really knowing it. So this is sort of your unconscious at work. And all the stimuli is getting into your brain, it's hitting the retina, it's, hitting your, it's getting into your cortex, but something, the perception of it isn't really reaching the level of consciousness, yet it's still affecting behavior. Um, another example that was done in the lab is this. So basically they show very fastly, they flash this image or this image, so the person says they don't see anything. Subliminally they show this, either this or this. Then superliminally, so the person is aware of it, they show this neutral image of boy and they just say, rate what you think adjectives about this boy. If they saw this image beforehand, they'll rate him as much more negative. And if they saw this image as more positive. So again, and this is happening, this is a, you can't say it's a sort of dumb unconscious, it's happening at a very high level of, of, of processing. Um, and it's not only with pictures, this also could happen with, with words. So in this task by Tony Marcel, they showed, um, again, subliminally, because they would flash this and then mask it with these X's so that people would say they haven't seen anything. And their whole task then was they'd be given a word, either a real word or a nonsense word, and they just had to say, is it a word or not? Now, if they were shown the word truck, uh, bread, for example, subliminally, before the word sandwich, they were much quicker to say sandwich was a word. So they were primed. And the interesting thing here is it's, it's not just happening at the, at the level of the, the it's, a, it's not just happening at the sound of the word or the shape of the letters, it's the meaning of the word, the meaning that the word bread goes with sandwich. So, so it's to say that this unconscious is highly, it's, it's using semantics and that and it's, it's a highly, it's not a dumb unconscious, it's very aware, and it's priming now, she's quicker to respond to sandwich because she saw the word bread subliminally. Um, and these kinds of studies go way back, there was a study that was done in the 70s, a free association study, where basically people were told simply just to learn word pairs, that was their task. 
And then afterwards, they were given a free association task. Now, if the people were asked, if one of the word pairs was, let's say, ocean moon, then later in the free association task, if they were told, now name a detergent, they were much more likely to say tide as a detergent. And when you ask them why, they'll say, well, you know, my mother used it as a kid, or I really like that detergent. So they'll come up with all, they confabulate and all sorts of explanations about why they came up with the word, when really they were primed. So if you think about going through the world and all the stimuli that's coming in and the advertisements and whatnot, you know, do you really want that hamburger or were you somehow primed? So much of our behavior is affected by this. Um, there was an, a recent study that came out in science um, that came out of Yale where they had subjects who were going to the lab and they were on their way to go to do an experiment, but they were intercepted by a, a lab assistant on the way who was carrying a bunch of books and a cup of coffee. And they said to the subject, oh, can you hold my cup of coffee for a minute? And it was either a hot cup of coffee or a cold iced coffee. So the subject did it, and then they proceeded to go into the lab and do the real task, which was to read um, an essay about a hypothetical person and then rate that person on, on adjectives and traits. So if they had held the hot cup of coffee, they were much more likely to rate the person as being warm and friendly and open versus the cold cup of coffee. And this was a very controlled time. I mean, this was in science. This is a top science journal, right? And, and this is a very well-controlled um, study. There are also other studies which show, for instance, if you're in a lab doing a task and afterwards they give you cookies as a reward, if they put in a faint um, a smell of lemon cleaner, the people are much more likely to clean up their crumbs after themselves. Or um, if there's a briefcase in the room and one person can see it and they're, they're playing a competitive task, the person who's in sight of the briefcase can, will be, act much more competitively. So this works in a whole variety of measures, the semantics, the smells, um, all sorts of information can get in and affect our behavior in a very profound way. So the question is really, you know, what's going on in the brain? What's, what's the underlying neural basis of, of these processes? How is this working on the neural level? This is one interesting neuroimaging study that came out of um, London, Chris Frith's, Frith's group, looking at un understanding our, the un unconscious motivation, what's motivating our, motivating our behaviors. And in this task here, they showed either a pound, which is it's worth about a dollar, and a penny. And the, the image was flashed on the screen for either 17, 50, or 100 milliseconds, and then there were two masks on either end. So what happened was, when it was flashed for only 17 or 50 milliseconds, they would claim they hadn't seen anything, although the stimulus was presented. And they only claimed they saw it at 100 milliseconds. And their task was, they had this little hand grip, and the harder they squeezed the hand grip, the more of the money they could win. So obviously when there was a pound, they were much more motivated to squeeze harder, which they did when they saw a pound versus a penny. However, the interesting thing is, even when it was presented subliminally, and they just told were to squeeze anyway, they said they didn't see anything, they still squeezed harder for the subliminally presented pound than for the, the penny. And when they did neuroimaging, what they found is that whether it was presented superliminally or subliminally, um, the area that was activated in the brain was called the ventral pallidum, which is part of the basal ganglia, is one of these subcortical structures in the brain, which um, tends to motivate behavior. It's, <clears throat> it's unconscious motivation. So people, the, the, whether the pound is presented, again, in the conscious realm or in the unconscious realm, the areas in the brain that, that are active toward, let's say, reward, um, become activated either way, outside of awareness. So you can imagine how this is starting to motivate people's um, behavior. And a study we did in, in our lab, um, we were looking at people with pathological gambling, and we did a, a neuroimaging task, and we looked at gamblers versus healthy controls at their, not just what happens when they get the reward, but looking at the period of the anticipation of the reward. So here, we gave them, we said, you're either going to get, you're about to win $5, or lose $5, or lose or gain nothing. And then they just had to wait, then they press the button, then they wait again, and then they actually get the reward or the punisher. But what we were interested in is this period here, when they're, when they're anticipating getting the reward, and, and what's going on in their brain during that, during that anticipatory period. And what we found is when we looked at the reward condition versus the neutral condition, the pathological gamblers had re reduced activation in the area 
that was similar to the study I just talked about in the basal ganglia called the ventral striatum. Now, in healthy people, when they're anticipating reward, there's actually increased activation in this area. It's sort of this pleasure center of the brain. And these people have decreased activation. So one idea here is that they're actually chronically understimulated. So they're seeking out reward. They need higher levels of reward to, reward to get the same level of stimulation that a healthy control would get. So you know, this makes sense given the types of gambling uh, g behaviors that gamblers do. You know, they're not satisfied. They need more. They need more. And it could be that they're chronically understimulated in this sort of reward center of the brain, in this basal ganglia, which again is motivating behavior unconsciously. So, given these priming studies that I talked about, imaging studies, they all seem to show that the subconscious or unconscious brain is much more active and purposeful and independent than we once thought, and it can selectively activate our goals and our motives. And subliminal stimuli produces enough neural acti activation in order to trigger a be a, a, an appropriate behavioral response, again, at a, very, a relatively very high cognitive level. So, the question is, what's missing? Something in the neural activity that's, that's produced by this subliminal stimuli is not adequate for consciousness to arise. Right? It's adequate enough to affect our thoughts and behaviors, but something is missing in that neural activity, where, and, and, you know, which is consciousness. So what's missing? And this is what is this whole field of neuroscience. This was sort of started, well, was legitimized by Francis Crick, who was the co-discoverer of DNA, along with James Watson and Christoph Koch, um, who put forth this, they said, listen, consciousness can be studied scientifically, and let's look for the neural correlates of consciousness, the NCC, which is the, the minimal neural mechanisms necessary for a specific conscious percept, memory, or event to occur. So each particular percept will have a certain neural signature in the brain. And let's try to figure out what that is. And so this motivated a whole field of research now um, let's say in the past 20 years, looking at for the searching for the neural correlates of consciousness. But everyone seemed to ignore the 95% of the activity in the brain which is unconscious and also um, which really is affecting behavior. But where is the line drawn between these sort of things that get to the level of consciousness in terms of the neural basis and where, and where, is the, you know, where do you draw the line between conscious and unconscious? Um, how much of the brain do you need? for consciousness? Do you need the whole brain? Do you need just the subcortical structures? Is it specific parts of the cortex? Is it just the prefrontal cortex? You know, so is it an anatomical differentiation? Or is it something to do with the cell type or the cell firing? It also depends on the definition. And um, what I just want to touch upon briefly is the difference between what we call enabling factors versus um, the specific percepts. So it's important here, before I go on, to make a distinction between consciousness as such, or what we call wakefulness, and then the content of consciousness or awareness. Wakefulness, or basically what we, we need these enabling factors for, it's, it's whether you're um, in a, a coma, or persistent vegetative state, or fully awake, or asleep, these are different states of consciousness. Are you under anesthesia? Um, so basically what these, the areas of brain that are involved in just simply for the brain to be awake are these, are these midline um, structures that sort of energize the brain or, or sort of think of it like the power station. So you have um, the reticular activating system. So you have these nuclei in the brain stem and midbrain that sort of um, shoot out neurotransmitters and bathe the brain in things like norepinephrine and acetylcholine and keep the brain awake. And you need these to be active in order to just have an awake brain. And also we find important are these cholinergic pathways from the brain stem. And also um, the intralaminal nucleus of the thalamus seems to be very important. So if you get a small lesion in any one of these areas, um, basically you go into a, 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 a consciousness is knocked out completely in sort of a comatose state. Whereas if you get the same size lesion, let's say in the cerebral cortex, you're still going to be awake and conscious. So you might have specific deficits in consciousness. For instance, a certain lesion might knock out your perception of color or your perception of motion or some, it might affect your attention, but it's not going to knock out consciousness completely. But if you knock out one of these areas in the sort of main power station of the brain, knock, consciousness is knocked out. So, but, the, and this is where you can get into a lot of studies Nick Schiff does at Cornell looking at, you know, persistent vegetative state patients and, and Adrian Owen and, and at, at, um, at Cambridge. That's not what we're going to talk about now. We're going to assume that the brain is fully on and functioning. You're not, you know, you're fully awake, 
not in a, some kind of a drug state or a coma. And then once the brain, we know it's all awake, then what we start to look for are these specific neurocorrelates of consciousness for one particular percept. So this is the, the content of consciousness. So for instance, you know, you smell mom's apple pie or, and you want to say what exactly in the brain is happening when you have that particular percept. And there are some studies where we, when we're going in for neurosurgery and can stimulate parts of the brain, particularly in the medial temporal lobe, and they could actually um, produce a, a very specific memory. So somehow in the neural circuitry wired into our brains are these, are these memories, are these percepts, and we want to understand what each of them is. So in order to explain this fact, I just wanted to show a little movie clip right here. Hopefully this works. So what I want you to do here is just, and I'm not sure if it'll work given the distance, stare at this, don't move your eyes, or actually stare right down here, it might work a little better. And don't move your eyes and just stare at it. And what do you see happening? Oh, yeah. So either just stare at that X or maybe just stare at a point at the bottom. What, what do you see happening? Right, so the yellow, the yellow box is disappearing, yeah? Now they're still there, I can assure you. They're still there, they're bright, they're yellow, they're, they're very salient. But what's happening? So, so this stimuli, those, that, 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 the, that's hitting your retina, that's getting into the lateral geniculate nucleus, into your visual cortex, is being processed by your brain. That stimuli on the outside is not going away. What's changing is what's happening in your head. The percept is changing. You either see it or you don't. And this is the, what we're talking about, trying to follow the neurocorrelates of consciousness. What is changing in your brain that's causing you to see it when you, and when you do, do see it when you don't? So we can control this in the lab. We can tell people to press a button when you see it, when you don't. You can do things like neuroimaging with this. But this is the kind of thing I'm talking about for the neurocorrelates of consciousness. What goes on when you see it? What goes on when you don't? So let me just get back to here. Um... Okay, so this is just a, sh a brief list of some of the proposals <laughs> that have been put forth to understand what the neurocorrelates of consciousness are. Um, there's a whole variety you can take your pick. Um, you know, some of them, this 40 hertz oscillations that was proposed by Crick and Koch. There's, I mean, oh, I'm not going to go through all of them. But this is just to say there are a lot of theories out there about what these neurocorrelates of consciousness are. One, though, that has been get, gotten a lot of um, attention, and it's pretty well accepted as being one of the strong uh, possibilities in the field, although some say it might relate to attention versus consciousness, is this idea of um, synchronized firing in the brain. So basically, you have these um, short temporal coalitions of distributed populations of neurons that somehow are firing in sync. These co so if you think about when you see something out in the world, well, you see it, you can, you can hear things, you can smell it. You have one full um, cohesive conscious experience. You don't, things aren't sort of come to you in disparate and then you put them together somewhere in the brain. There's no one place where all the stimuli comes together. What it is is you'll have some neurons firing in the visual cortex, in the auditory cortex, maybe in the prefrontal cortex, and they don't all just come together in one place and then you have one cohesive conscious experience. The idea is that somehow these neurons are firing in sync, and the synchrony of the firing is what coalesces them together into one full conscious percept. So if you think about an orchestra, you're in the beginning when they're all warming up and they're all sort of, you know, disjointed and out of tune and then you have the conductor and they're not all playing the same note like that would be sort of an epileptic seizure okay so everyone's playing at the same time but they're playing different things but they're all in harmony together so if you think about this sort of synchronized oscill oscillatory firing of neurons and there's an ebb and flow you have these coalitions of neurons that are coupled um, to encode one percept and then they might stay in conscience for a while and then they, they go down and then another one wins and they're, so they sort of born and die in, in terms of a fraction of a second or more and they, members of a coalition of neurons can reinforce each other and suppress other members. Attention can bias these coalitions so if you attend to something you can then keep it in consciousness for longer. Um, so this is one idea about some, a, a bit about the, the, the understanding the neural basis of consciousness and what gets into consciousness and what stays below the surface. Um, and just to illustrate this, <clears throat> this is a, um, a, a study 
that was done in monkeys looking at um, what there was a difference in their neural, so we can record neurons in, in, in monkeys and see what happens, when do they fire to what. And, oh yeah, and this is what they can do, um, this is what happens when they attend to a stimulus versus when they don't. So here you have one, you have two neurons firing out of sync. You see this one's firing here, this one's firing here, and when they summate on the third neuron, they're not going to um, get there at the same time and cause enough activation um, for the excitatory postsynaptic potential, you know, for this to fire. However, if you get these two neurons, when they attend, actually they start firing in sync, and then when they summate on the third neuron, they cause enough neural activation for that to fire. So if you can think of populations of thousands and millions of neurons coming together, they're not all necessarily firing at the same time, but they're firing in sync. And this is the difference we could see between, in monkeys, between an attended and a non-attended condition. Now, we can see, I think single cell, single stu recording studies are the best because we're looking at actual neural firing versus brain imaging where we do now in humans where we're looking at it's sort of there's a, a large temporal delay because we're just looking at blood flow we're not looking at the actual neurons firing but what's very exciting is we're starting to do studies now where we're using deep brain stimulation to treat certain psychiatric illnesses this is a whole nother lecture but the exciting thing there is that we can now in 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 humans during surgery because they're awake during surgery um, record human neurons to certain stimuli um, and this is all really sort of cutting edge, new, and, and exciting work. And again, it's can't, it's only can be done in very rare cases, but we're starting to do this kind of work at Mount Sinai now, um, and I'm really excited about it. But that's a side note. So, in terms of experiments, again, showing the synchrony of firing, we have here this experiment where the people are shown either this upright face, and they identify it as a face, or the same stimuli, but it's a turned down face, so they don't identify it as a face. But again, the stimuli coming in is the same, that's hitting the retina, hitting the brain, although the percept is different. And when they measure this, when they look at um, EEG and look at brain activation, and they, they looked at synchrony. The black lines are symbolic of synchrony, synchronous fire across the cortex, and the blue lines are asynchronous firing. And what you can see is the brains on the, the, the head that's represented on the left are the ones who saw the face, and the ones on the right are the one that saw the, didn't recognize it as a face. So you see here, initially, um, the image is the percept, they get the synchronous firing, they recognize it as a face, you get a lot of synchronous firing all across the cortex, and then, but in this one, they don't, they get desynchronous firing. Then you have a brief period of asynchrony, which is somehow in a way to, one coalition was in, in consciousness, now they sort of have to wipe it out, kind of erase it for another percept to come up. And then here, they both have synchronous firing because they're doing the motor response, they're either saying I saw the face or not. So this is a nice, simple example of say, seeing the correlation between perception and synchrony of firing across the cortex. In another study which looks at this, they looked at binocular rivalry. Um, this is basically, it's sort of like these, um, these perceptual things where you see a, a cube, it's a, called a bistable percept, and you can either see it, it switches from one perspective or the other, or this vase face where you either see the faces or the vase. Well, this is a little bit more sophisticated way of looking at this where you present one image to one eye and another image to another eye. Um, and then basically what happens is the percept isn't that you see um, a fused image of these two things. It, you either, in consciousness, either see one image or the other and they go back and forth. It's called binocular rivalry. So you have the same stimuli hitting the retina, getting into the brain, but what's changing here again is the percept. And this is great to look at experimental paradigms using this because again we can track the neural correlates of consciousness. And what they did in this experiment here is they showed a red vertical line and a blue horizontal grating, one to each eye, and they each flickered at a different rate and then they looked at imaging to see what happens in the brain. And what happened was the activity of dif different brain regions fired in sync when the person was aware of the, so when they were aware of the red vertical grating, you had this firing that corresponded to, to that versus the blue horizontal grating. This is sort of what it looks like here. The straight lines here, actually the blue lines indicate synchronous firing between cortical regions. And again, when the stimulus was perceived, there was an increase in the, both the intra and inter- and intrahemispheric um, synchronized firing in conjunction with the stimuli that they perceived rather than the one that was just presented. So, that's my little talk about consciousness, but all this other stuff that's going on underneath the surface, what is going on there? So we say, okay, we have these neural correlations, they're firing and that's nice and they get into perception, but all these things that are affecting our underlying behavior. 
So this is just another, a study that I thought was interesting looking at unconscious decision making. And this should be of interest to you. So basically they, they looked at people, they gave them a task, they had to make a decision, and they gave them a number of variables in which to, to decide on. Either a small number of variables like four, or a larger number of variables like 12. And they gave them either time to think about it, so here are all the variables, here are the positives and negatives, you can think about it and then make a decision, or they distracted them um, by doing anagram tasks and then they had to make a decision. And they were testing this deliberation without attention hypothesis was basically that simple choices, um, let's say between buying a towel or an oven mint, oven mint are, are made better when you use conscious thought, but much more complex choices like to marry this person or buy this house um, should be left to unconscious thought. And the idea behind this is that conscious thought is very precise, yes, but, and it can follow certain rules, like I don't want to go over this particular price, but because of its low capacity, it might not lead to good choices when there are many, many variables. And conscious thought, although it's not as precise, it has a much larger capacity and, and a degree of complexity. So, unconscious. unconscious, sorry, yes, unconscious, so that when you have some task that involves a number of variables where you can't just sit and make a list what's good and what's bad, um, that it's better to go with unconscious thought. And that's exactly what they found. I'm not going to get into all the details of the study. You can look it up, the science paper. But they looked at both real world choices and in the lab, and they found that purchasing complex products were viewed more favor favorably when decisions were made in the absence of attentive deliberation. You can think about that. When you have a big decision, you want to sleep on it or, you know, uh, people solving uh, in complex mathematical equations, sometimes they need to just take, yes, you need to take in all the variables consciously, but then let it go. And then somehow these decisions, they call them gut feelings. And this something the con unconscious is doing that seems to be people are much more satisfied post-decisional satisfaction after they allow their unconscious to do its work and then make a decision. Um, and this, co this co coincides nicely with studies that were done with Libet, Benjamin Libet, and more recently studies with John Dylan Haynes that are done in Berlin, which look at decision making and they measured, Libet did it by measuring um, action potentials in the brain. John Dylan Haynes is using fMRI, but in both cases they find that the brain activation occurs before, so be much before the actual person is aware of the decision they're going to make. In John Dylan Haynes' case, the person had to decide just press this button or that button, and they could predict the button the person was going to press based on the neural activity that was sort of gearing up to do it before the person became consciously aware that they were deciding. And some of this work is controversial, um, is especially the Benjamin Libet stuff that was done in the past, but it's all sort of going, coinciding with this idea that the sort of brain is deciding first, and only after the fact we become aware of it. Um, I'm just going to skip that. And if you were interested in this topic, there's a whole array of studies here that show that the much very recent studies, all done within the last few years, that conscious thought doesn't always lead to the best choices. There are studies which show that when people are just before they're going to have a flash of insight, um, they, they can predict this with brain activity, predicts the moment of insight. For instance, they give them some riddles and the people have to solve them, and they do um, recording of brain activity and they find they can predict just before the person's going to solve the puzzle based on the brain imaging. So these are just an array, array of studies which show this, this conscious thought at work, uh, unconscious thought at work. So now to something more familiar to you all, which I probably don't have to go into any detail, Freud's theory of the mind, right? And you have this sort of tip of the iceberg idea where consciousness is just the very tip of the iceberg. And then you have these other air parts of the mind that are submerged deep under it that people are not unaware of. You have some pre-conscious, which is sort of like if I asked you, well, what did you have for breakfast? You, can, you weren't thinking about it right now, but you can easily go back and, and pull it and recall it. Whereas you have the unconscious, which is so deep down that you can't recall these at will. And then, of course, the superego, which is balancing between the, I mean, the ego, which is balancing between the superego and the id, and then there's these internal conflicts, either between the id or the superego and or id com conflicts which cause anxiety and somehow the ego has to use defense mechanisms in order to um, resolve these or keep the consciousness, um, protect the consciousness. All right, that was probably a really simple, simplified explanation, but I'm sure you all know about psychoanalytic theory. The idea here, though, the thing that I'm interested in as a neuroscientist, because my explanation probably in this area is not as good as you could explain it, but what I'm interested in is what's going on in the brain when people are engaging in these defense mechanisms, when they're trying to keep things out of consciousness and protect consciousness from these thoughts or memories. Um, 
how, what are the neural mechanisms behind this? So um, three defense mechanisms which, which um, I'm going to talk about, which, can start, which we're starting to look at experimentally, um, are suppression, repression, and dissociation. Suppression being the conscious pushing away of unwanted thoughts in, into the unconscious or the pre-conscious. Like, for instance, I'm at work now. I'm not going to think about you know, the fight I just had with my boyfriend. I'm going to push it away. Then there's repression, where there's this unconscious process of pulling thoughts outside of, away from um, awareness. And then dissociation, which is slightly different, whereas with suppression and repression, you think of it as pushing it down into the unconscious, where dissociation is a kind of separating out of, of um, emotions or memories from the rest of the psyche, a kind of a splitting, um, in order so that um, there's, a, there's a negative emotion or memory that person doesn't want to have conscious awareness to. They kind of separate it out from their, their, their conscious experience. In terms of suppression, um, one nice neuroimaging study to try to understand the neural basis of this is this think-no-think -think paradigm um, by, by Michael Anderson, who's now at the CBU in Cambridge. He was up at St. Andrews. And he does this think-no-think -think paradigm where basically people first have to learn word pairs like ordeal and roach, and then they're scanned in the neuroimager, and they're shown one, one of the word pairs, let's say ordeal. And in the respond condition, they're told, now I want you to recall the word that goes with ordeal. In the suppression condition, they're told to, to prevent the associated word from entering consciousness for the whole four seconds, so don't think about the word. And with this, you don't get this, um, like Dan Wagner at Harvard talks about this rebound effect where you know don't think about a white elephant and then all you can do is think about it. Um, you don't get that because you're not directly telling them not to think of the word roach. It's a sort of second level order. You're saying just don't think of the word that goes with this word. So you're not telling them specifically don't think of roach. And so the way the method and experimental paradigm is, they actually um, don't get the rebound effect and they do get forgetting. So um, suppression during scanning actually made subjects later, they gave them a memory task of the words like roach and they were much, um, they had a harder time actually remembering those words. So that suppression actually made them unable to recollect the memories which had been formed pre-scanning. Um, and this, this memory deficit was beyond that for simple just forgetting over time. So they actively were able to forget these words above and beyond the other words where they weren't told to suppress. And this is just showing the, the, the data. Um, <clears throat> so here you have the suppression, so you have the training period where they learn the word pairs and then in the Suppression condition, they're given ordeal and told don't think of it. In the respond, they're told, given a word, let's steam. They think of the word that goes with it, and then there's a baseline where they're not told anything. And then in the afterwards, they're, they're asked, now I want you to remember the word that goes with ordeal or steam or jaw. And they're also were given a little bit harder memory task, an independent probe, where they have to say, think of an insect that starts with R. In either case, whether they give a same probe or an independent probe, in the suppression condition, you can see here they had significant deficit in memory. So they really, this was an active process that does occur. Because you know, I talk at some neuroscience conferences or meetings and people are skeptical that these things even exist, like repression and dissociation. And you know, I start to explain the neural correlates of it and they say, well, I don't even know that these phenomena even exist. So this is just saying behaviorally, yes, we can show in the lab that this actually exists. And then what do we see in the brain? Well, actually, we see there's a brain area... Um, of regions that are more active during suppression. And most of these areas are prefrontal regions. So suppression actually is an active process. It takes brain power to do. Um, and these, these areas in the prefrontal cortex are also known to be important for executive control, like inhibiting. When we look at people who have deficits, in, um, who, who are very um, impulsive, they seem to have deficits of activation in the prefrontal cortex. So here we're seeing more activation in the prefrontal cortex. and reduced activation in the hippocampus. So you have these, which is the memory area of the brain. So you have these prefrontal areas which are actively down-regulating pre-hippocampal uh, and subcortical areas. This also can happen with emotions too. There's, you can have prefrontal activation which down-regulates amygdala activation which is involved in emotions. In this case, it was memory. So, and this is just showing that the imaging, the blue areas, act, areas of deactivation, that's the hippocampus, and these, these yellow and red areas are areas of activation. So you have these medial prefrontal areas that are coming, that are active, and they're down-regulating hippocampal activation. So this is a clear mechanism that we can see here. So basically controlling unwanted memories in this case was associated with increased, specifically dorsolateral prefrontal activation and reduced hippocampal activation and behaviorally they had impairment of the memories. 
And again, so this people might suppress by recruiting this dorsolateral areas to disengage hippocampal, hippocampal areas. And this, is, this confirms this active process whereby people can prevent the awareness of unwanted past experiences and memories. Um, and it's starting to, ha starting to provide a neurobiological model of this you know, form of suppression or repression that was proposed by, by Freud. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to get into this. But I would like to talk a little bit about repression now. Repression is much harder to get at because it happens unconsciously. You can't tell people to consciously repress. It's sort of something that automatically occurs. So how can we measure this in the lab? Well, this was just one study that I, I came across, um, but there's really not much out there. Um, this was done by Libet, the person I told you about previously, who did these recordings of neurons and looked at, found that there was called the readiness potential, that the brain actually gears up before the person consciously is aware that they're making a decision. He, that's Libet. So he was part of this study. And basically what they did here was they had people who were going in for neurosurgery for dyskinesias, for movement disorders. And when they were going for surgery, they were awake, so he could record neurons and, and also stimulate, oh yeah, sorry, he could stimulate um, the cortex during neurosurgery while the patient was awake. And what they did was they found a critical time period for neural activation that was needed in order for a stimulus to become conscious. So basically, during neurosurgery, they stimulated um, supplement, uh, um, primary somatosensory cortex, which is the motor cortex of the brain. He stimulated a part of the brain which corresponded contralaterally to the other hand or wrist. So basically he used this very, um, this train of repetitive pulses, about 0.5 milliseconds of liminal intensity, and he found that it had to persist for around 500 milliseconds in order for, the, for it to elicit a sensation, for the person to say, oh, I now feel that in my wrist. So now you're having direct cortical activation and seeing how long does it take to come to the level of consciousness, awareness, the person feels something in their wrist. But there was um, variation between subjects. So certain subjects had a longer um, critical time period that it took for them to become aware. And it varied between 200 and 800 milliseconds. And they also then gave them a whole battery of, uh, um, battery of psychological tests that were measuring repression, the classical tests of repression. And what they found is that people who had a longer cortical, it took longer cortical activation for them to get the sensation had, were, had a greater tendency to repress. So the idea is that people who might need longer time for, it's a physiological mechanism, but longer time for activation of the cortex to reach consciousness might be prone to use repression as a defense mechanism. Just like people with high intelligence might be prone to use intellectualization as a defense mechanism. So some innate physiological property is sort of dictating what kinds of defense mechanisms people might be more prone to use. Um, finally, I want to talk about dissociation. Uh, and again, this is, is an, uh, difficult to measure in the lab, but we can look at people with disorders, and that makes it a little bit easier. So as I said before, dissociation, it's de defined in the DSM as a disruption in the usual integration, integrated functions of consciousness and memory and identity. It's sort of a splitting up. So normally we have a cohesive whole where our memories and our affects and our, and our thoughts are all um, sort of in one cohesive um, conscious stream. But in these cases, there's this separation between these, these things. And it's thought to be more prevalent in people with mental illness, but it's also common in, in healthy people. Everybody dissociates to a certain extent. Um, and if you just think of moments when you're fully engaged in something or in a book or a movie, you lose sight, sense of your body awareness or um, you, know, you walk into a room and then you sort of forget why you actually you knew you were going for something, but you forget what it was that you went there for. Um, you know, these things, it's sort of these dissociations that occur in everyday life where, you know, you're driving and all of a sudden you lost track and you had passed your exit 10 minutes ago. So a bit of dissociation. But what we look at, look at what we're looking at is these pathological, pathological cases of dissociation. There are three categories in the DSM. One is depersonalization or depersonalization disorder where people feel detached from their, from their own body, from their own mental processes. They're not delusional. They know that this is not, their, their reality testing is intact, but they, things seem unfamiliar to them. They are very hypo-emotional. They tend to um, lack feeling, emotions. And there's a sense of unreality um, and, you know, again, disconnection from their, their body. 
Um, there's dissociative identity disorder, which used to be called multiple personality disorder, but because it was thought that there were a bunch of different personalities and they all had to come together into one, but now it's called dissociative identity disorder because the idea is that they're not multiple personalities, that they're just, we have one whole personality and then it's been fragmented, and so the idea is to make it back into one cohesive whole. Um, and in this case, usually they've had some kind of a trauma, and due to the trauma, they've sort of have one personality that has access to traumatic memories, and then the other personality does not. And then they're in the, the amnesias, which I'm not going to get into, because the only studies I'm going to talk about are the ones that have to do with depersonalization disorder and dissociative identity disorder. In terms of depersonalization disorder, this is a study that we're, uh, we did in our lab. We're about to write up the results. I won't get into too much detail, but the... What we looked at 19 depersonalization disorders and 22 match controls, we gave them a whole comprehensive neuropsych battery. Um, and what we found is that the, the depersonalization disorder patients actually didn't have any neurocognitive deficits except for a time perception deficit. Um, but they did better on this intra-extra dimensional set shifting task, which is analogous to this Wisconsin card sorting task where you have to shift sort of cognitive flexibility between um, um, different uh, concepts. And they did better at this. And there's other studies that also show that they do better in like divided attention tasks. So somehow there seems to be this um, ability to, to do, to almost being in two consciousnesses or having the ability to do multiple things at once, above and beyond someone, the healthy controls. And this task is actually sensitive, bless you, it's a dorsolateral prefrontal cortex function. And if you remember in the previous study of suppression, we showed that they have hyperactivation of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in order to downmodulate the hippocampus. So in this case, there, it also seems that they're having hyperactivation of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, and this might explain their enhanced performance on this task. So that memory suppression and emotional regulation, again, has been associated with an increase. It takes more energy. That's why things like maybe hypnosis or going under, at least to use sodium amytal to, to down, to decrease this active prefrontal cortex and allow these suppressed memories or emotions to come to the surface. Because again, it takes acti activation, it takes work to keep these things outside of awareness. And that's what we're finding here as well. Lastly, dissociative identity disorder, again, formerly multiple personality disorder, they have two different kinds of states. They have these neutral identity states in which they don't have access to the traumatic memories. And so, therefore, this enables them to, to um, be, have a normal daily functioning. And then they have these traumatic identity states where they do have access and they repress the memories. And it's been shown in various studies that they have different psychobiological characteristics um, in these two different states that can't easily be stimulated, uh, assimilated in, in controls. So, for instance, there's differences in electrodermal activity, skin conductance, they have differences in their EEG pattern when they're in these two different states, in arousal, and, and surprisingly, in visual, visual evoked potential. So, this is a study I found out of Germany. It was deep in the literature, and, and it was in German. I had to have my friend translate it was amazing. So this is a study in which there's a woman, she had dissociative identity disorder. In one personality, she claimed she could see. In the other personality, she claimed she was blind. And the other personality was a man, I think. And so, of course, we think, okay, she's confabulating. That's impossible. Physiologically speaking, you can't be blind in one state and see in another. She had no um, physical damage to the retina or anything like that. And so what they did is they gave her these checkerboard patterns that flashed and alternated at um, particular rates. And they did uh, recordings from her visual cortex in the brain, in the back of the head, did EEG recordings. And they found when she was in her sighted state that the brain activity, when she was looking at the checkerboard pattern, alternated its squares at 10 times a second. And this corresponded to the brain activity in the visual cortex. It alternated according, and she said, I can see it. And then she had that visual evoked potential. But in the, sta in, the, in the personality state when she said she couldn't see, she actually did not have visual evoked potential in the visual cortex, which from a neuroscience point of view is fascinating because that's, you can't control that consciously. I mean, that's at the basic sensory processing level. That's beyond just, you know, um, suppressing a thought. That means that you get, you get images coming into your eye, they go through the optic nerve, they get to the, the thalamus, they go directly to V1, this primary visual cortex, and that's where she's having suppression going on. So this is actually really a fascinating case, and um, very strong evidence that this is a real phenomenon, but how it occurs, we don't know. And un not unfortunately, I mean fortunately, but unfortunately for science, 
she got better, so they, <laughs> they, <laughs> because we wanted to test this patient, you know, bring her in and test her, but they um, were able to bring together all the different personalities and she got better and she was able to see. But this is fascinating. And there's also other studies which show they have differences in their allergies to certain drugs in different states. I mean, it's, it's how this occurs at the neural level is, is, is really beyond me. Um, but we're trying to understand. Another study just looking at the at, at volume, the, um, doing a not functional MRI, but structural MRI of um, dissociative disorder patients, found that their hippocampal volume, the actual size of it, and the amygdala, they were, they were actually smaller in these patients. Um, so it's smaller hippocampus, smaller amygdala. Now, what's happening there? Why is it smaller? It's hard to say. Is it chicken before the egg? Is it that there's certain stress that they have early on. Stress can activate NMDA receptors in the hippocampus, and early life exposure to these to to cortisol and glucocortico glucocorticoids um, during stress might progressively atrophy the hippocampus during development. So that could be what's happening. The mechanisms for a smaller amygdala, it's not that clear. Um, or it may not be that stress is causing the hippocampus damage, but rather maybe those who are born with a smaller hippocampus volume might be at greater risk for dissociative identity disorder. So again, genetics can contribute to the fact some people might be born with a smaller hippocampus amygdala, and that um, when they're exposed to trauma, they have less defenses, less ability to be able to defend against it, and they go on to develop dissociative identity disorder. Because they also found that abused subjects without dissociative identity disorder in this study had a larger hippocampus and amygdala volumes than non-abuse subjects. This might be a protective factor, perhaps. So it's hard to say, did the early stress cause their, their, their shrinkage of these um, very important areas that have to do with memory and emotion? Or you know, were they born with it and then they, they have less resources to, um, they're less resilient to trauma? And the last study that I'm going to talk about is, <clears throat> again, with these dissociative disorder patients, a really interesting study. Here they took 11 uh, dissociative disorder patients with self-controlled switching. So they were trained in therapy to be able to, um, on cue, switch between different personality, between the neutral identity state and the traumatic identity state. And what they told the, the researcher and all the, or the therapist, I think, was they had scripts of neutral memories that were endorsed by both states, like an autobiographic memory that they were they said, yes, that occurred to me in both the neutral state and the dissociative state. And then they were given, then they told the therapist traumatic memory scripts that were only experienced in the traumatic state. And when they were told these memory scripts in the neutral state, they said, no, I mean, that, you know, it's an interesting story, but that never happened to me. And um, what they had the patients do was listen to, to um, the autobiographical memory scripts involving either the neutral or the traumatic related experience while they were in the scanner and while they were in e either the neutral or the traumatic memory state. So you have four conditions here, exposure to neutral or traumatic memory script while in the neutral or traumatic state. And they also, they looked at, um, so they looked at cerebral blood flow, they used PET neuroimaging, they had subjective ratings of emotion and sensory motor, and they had cardiovascular response, so heart rate, blood pressure, heart rate variability. And what they found is that the patients showed different psychobiologic reactions to the trauma-related memory. So this is really interesting here. And this, I remember there's one skeptic neuroscience in the, scientist in the audience, and then he saw this data and was a little bit less skeptical at the end, so that was good. But he, so basically here you have the neutral memory script, and over on this side the traumatic memory script. And you have heart rate, blood pressure. These are all sort of unconscious, you know, autonomic processes. And then also subjective emotion ratings. And then you have the solid line is when they're listened to either script in the traumatic memory state, and the dotted line is when they listen to it in the neutral memory state. Now, you can see here, they had the neutral memory and the traumatic memory. In the neutral state, heart rate didn't change much between these two memory scripts, right? They're, they're treating the traumatic memory as if it's just neutral. But when they're in the traumatic state and they say they have access to this memory and it occurs to them, they get an increase in heart rate. Okay, and the same thing with blood pressure here. In the neutral state, it doesn't matter whether it's a neutral memory script or a traumatic memory script, they're not getting increased blood pressure. In the traumatic state, when they say they have access to that memory, they are. So not only, they're not just claiming, I don't have access to this memory. They're not having 
physiological responsivity to the memory either. So they are actively somehow keeping this memory outside of awareness. And they're not having the, the, the physiological reactions to the memory as well. So it's not just subjective. There's objective measures of this. And then when you look at the scanner, what happens in their brain during this is that basically when they're in the neutral memory state, these are all the areas that become more active, the areas in red. And when they're in a traumatic memory state where they do have access to the memories, you have the areas in green that are active. Well, you can see in the neutral memory state, there's much more of brain activity going on because it's taking, again, a lot of extra brain power in order to downregulate and keep the traumatic memories outside of awareness. When they're in the traumatic memory state, they're just open. They have access to them. They don't need to downregulate anything. And again, this leads into the idea of why things maybe like um, hypnosis or maybe relaxation therapy or things of that nature might be helpful because it's allowing these defenses, or I would call it this extra brain activity in prefrontal cortex, which is the executive center of the brain, to sort of come offline and allow the traumatic memories and memories to come up and somehow be reintegrated um, into the neocortex at the physiological level, to be reintegrated into the neural networks that are encoding memories in a fully um, integrated way, not in a disparate way, because they seem to be now in these disparate areas and not fully integrated on a physiological level. So, to sum up, how does this splitting of consciousness relate to the neural correlates of consciousness? What's going on in the brain? It seems that these split brain patients that we see, these neurological patients, we have split brain patients where we actually physically split the connection between the two hemispheres, the corpus callosum, as a treatment for epilepsy so the seizure won't spread. And they, in certain studies, they seem to have two half brains or two consciousnesses within, within the same head. And there are a lot of psychological studies that have been looked at to look at these patients. So we think that you definitely need this connection between the two hemispheres in order to have a fully conscious um, percept. So the neural correlates must, must employ these colossal fibers that connect the two hemispheres, but these dissociative patients don't have a cut corpus callosum. So what's going on with them? Um, could it be that maybe split brain patients who have a physical split in their brain or these dissociative patients might be devoid of conflicting? In, 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 in healthy humans, there's a lot of um, conflicting ideas and we're not able to do divided attention tasks that well. And maybe in some cases, split brain patients or dissociative patients, there's a lot of disadvantages, but they might have some sorts of advantages in that they can um, multitask and they have, so it's almost as if they have two consciousnesses in one head. It's a very strange phenomenon. Um, but there seems to be a remarkable similarity between psychiatric and neurological dissociation syndromes. So those that have a physical cut, let's say, in the brain, or a physical lesion, and then a psychiatric lesion, per se, or like a dissociation at the psychic level. Um, the main difference is that the latter is defined in terms of a physical di um, disconnection, that's the neurological patients, between specialized regions, let's say, like vision and motor areas, and then you have the former, which is a disconnection between psychic functions, like seeing and acting, or memory and emotion. But in both cases, the disorders um, can be considered disorders of integration, in that um, the first case, again, because of a neuroanatomical lesion, the second because of a functional or dynamic impairment in connectivity between brain areas. So what appears to be altered in both neurological and psychiatric patients' disconnection syndromes is not so much the degree of activity of a particular brain area, right? but it's the degree of interactivity between areas and functions. It's, so there's relative localization in the brain. Yes, there's sort of a speech area and an auditory area, but to have full conscious experience, it's the integration and the communication between these areas. And that's what I think is disturbed in these dissociative disorders. Um, and we, it's, what we think is that there's integration of cortical and subcortical areas is necessary for a cohesive conscious experience. And that many of these connections are NMDA mediated um, in that if you, if you give people the NMDA antagonist ketamine, which some people use as a club drug, um, it causes dissociative symptoms. People tend to dissociate. So the idea is that in order to not dissociate, you need intact NMDA um, connections between areas of the brain. And these can be um, cortical cortical areas, cortical subcortical, it could be the th thalamal cortical areas. But all these types of connectivity um, need to be in place for a one cohesive conscious experience. So, where do we go from there? 
Um, and as Maggie said in the beginning of this talk, I mean, when I first went in to do my PhD, it wasn't that long ago, it was 2000, I wanted to study consciousness, but you couldn't really do it um, and be taken legitimately as a scientist. But now there's these new advances in neuroscience and technology are starting to reveal the underlying neurobiology of this dynamic unconscious that was originally described by Freud and Janet and others. Um, and the process, some of what was put forth, you know, based on this talking core will be sort of um, <clears throat> refined or enhanced or revised. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I don't think everything Freud said was, you know, 100% true, but some of the ideas were, and, and some of them we can start to understand the neural basis of this. And only by jumping in and studying exactly how the brain processes information will we ever really fully understand the true nature of the dynamic unconscious. Um, and we also need to devise new ways using modern technology to, to test this dynamic unconscious and things like repression and dissociation. We need to come up with experimental paradigms that we can do in the lab. I mean, this is very different than, you know, what you, when you talk to someone on the couch and do psychotherapy. But if we really want to try to understand what's going on in the brain, we need to think about how do we do this empirically. And of course, Freud was a neuroscientist, and this will ultimately lead to more effective treatment options for psychiatric patients, but Freud ultimately thought that all these ideas were going to be instantiated in the brain, and this is a sketch that he did um, in 1895 of neurons. This was his sketch of repression, how he thought it might work, and that he thought that you normally have a flow of energy from neuron A to B, and then you have this sort of side cathexis that pulls the energy, or diverts it away from going from neuron A to B, and that now this postsynaptic attraction of the energy the neural, is the neural mechanism of repression. So these forbidden wishes and desires are being diverted away by this, this side cathexis energy, and this is the neural mechanism of it. And this is where it all began. In Vienna, I was just there three weeks ago. This is Freud's couch. This is where it, um, Burgasse 19, where he lived and worked for... 47 years until the, the Nazis came and he had to flee. Um, but this was really, this was sort of where it all began. That's the, the original couch in Vienna. Um, and finally, the unknown, what, what do we have left to just try to figure out? Well, in order to understand the neural basis of consciousness, we need to account for the complex dynamics that occur between the unconscious and the conscious thought. How much control do we have over that interaction? How does this relate to our concept of free will and willpower? Um, we, there's often, like I explained, a, ver a whole variety of things that, that affect our behavior and our decisions that are outside of awareness. And we don't understand how unconscious drives suddenly become conscious, like Freudian slips. Or conversely, why conscious drives suddenly become unconscious, like repression. How does this happen? Is it automatic? Um, or under which circumstances people are unable to override these hidden urges by force of will. So why can't people quit smoking or taking drugs or stop gambling? Um, and this is kind of things that we're studying in our lab with patients. And what's the neural basis of this ability or this sort of willpower? How can we enhance it to help treat people with these disturbing you know, behaviors? And lastly, what we really need is a theory of consciousness. So consciousness, is it something fundamental in the universe? Is it an emergent property of certain biological systems? If consciousness is substrate independent, that is, can it be instantiated? Is it just in human brains? Can it be in computers? Um, what, what is it? We need a, a fundamental theory of consciousness that explains it in the universe so we can measure it. And that information theory is actually what people are starting to look at now as a theory. There is no really theory of consciousness. It's the first real kind of theory that can be tested experimentally. It's called the integrated information theory of consciousness promoted by Giulio Tononi, who's at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. He's a psychiatrist. He's a psychiatrist by training, and he studies sleep disorders. Um, and, he's, and he's gotten a lot of um, positive feedback for this theory of consciousness. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but basically what he comes out with is he looks at, like I talked about, this integration. There's differentiated information. Um, and he comes up with a measure called phi, which is the measure of consciousness, which is a, a time and state dependent measure of integrated information. So it could be in anything. It doesn't have to just be a brain. But it has to be integrated information. So if you take your camera and it has all these little pixels on it, yes, there's a lot of bits of information, but they're not integrated. They don't talk to one another. OK, that's not integrated. That would have a very low phi. Um, but in the human brain, this integration of information that now they're working on all sorts of mathematical formulas. They're working on this at Caltech. They're working at it um, in, in Sussex, at Madison, in Cambridge, all, all over the world, trying to, can we calculate phi? 
And fundamentally, we need to be able to compute it for, let's say, a mouse brain. How much phi does that have? How much integrated information? Um, this is a, a, a nematode. This is a C. elegans. It has about uh, a couple of hundred neurons. We can't even calculate it for that, much less the human brain. Uh, but we're trying. And this is sort of all the known connections that, that are in the nematode right now and all the interactions. Again, we can't really calculate phi yet, but we're trying. And then, again, how much does a bee have? How much integrated information? How much consciousness does a bee have? And what about you know, the human brain? And what about a baby? And what about a persistent vegetative state patient? Um, can we measure it? What's the measure? Can we measure like a sort of have a machine that can measure the amount of consciousness? And what about this little rumba that runs around the room and cleans things? And you know, how does it know where to go? <laughs> and then my iPhone, how much consciousness does it have? And finally, you know what this is? The internet, right, the internet. Now, this is a high degree of integrated information. This has like 10 to the 11th nodes. It has more, um, it's, it's, it's approaching the level of the human brain in terms of its interconnectivity and each of its different nodes and its transistors. So, you know, is the, the internet conscious? Um, you know, but ultimately, in order to answer these questions, we really do need a fundamental theory of consciousness to an overarching theory so that we can make hypotheses and test it empirically and have, you know, a, a framework in which to study all of this. So with that, I thank you very much. <laughs>